and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about the ancient world, classical things, uh, and the education therein. Um, we are a bunch of guys that like old stuff, and two of us teach out of school, and three of us read books. <laughs> Good. Um, this, yeah. This, this sounds like a puzzle. Uh, if you are if you are just finding us, like you're like, old logic what is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of us is a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> One of us is Canadian. One of us is Canadian. Yeah. The blue character is standing just left of the yes. red character. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do this when I was in school. This is something you had to do. The logic puzzles? Yeah. You didn't do logic puzzles? No. That was like definitely a thing. The house with the blue door nope. burns coal in the fireplace. Never did it. The house with the orange orange door burns wood. Uh-huh. How's this a logic game? What, this one is. What does the purple house burn? Yeah, exactly. Oh. He's, he's making this one up. I don't know. Could be anything. The yeah. bodies. I don't coal, know. Coal, idiot. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, so. Uh, <laughs> I want Cole Idiot. I want that. I want that shirt. That's the one. I've never wanted any of our other shirts. If you're wondering what classical stuff is, you can find some of our older episodes wherein we talk about this on our website, classicalstuff.net. Um, or you can. Did you just send them to our podcast on our podcast? Yeah, they're listening to this podcast. What do you? No, I'm talking about old episodes. Oh, sure. You, you chuckleheads were uh, <laughs> talking about t-shirts over they there. Said if you want to know what classical stuff is, no, no, like the classical podcast, stuff. Like the you, thing no, no, no. To. You weren't listening <laughs> when I said if you wanted to know uh, if you're like, oh, what so is good. classical? I don't know what classical is. We have old episodes wherein we define the terms. This is That's true. all I'm saying. Oh, what classical yeah. is, not classical stuff. I was like, if they want to know what classical stuff is, they're you're literally here. listening Hello, to it. Oh my word. Oh my word. And I'm so sorry, all of you, for listening. Jeez Louise. I'm going to okay. have more cake. Good. <laughs> AJ's having the time of um, Anyway, yeah. Thomas has been doing a series on Herodotus. Yes. And I believe we are continuing said series on Herodotus. And we're going to Egypt. Is that fair? We are going to Egypt. You know what? My 12th grade class in high school, we went to Egypt. Did you actually? Yeah. Is that insane? Wait, that is insane. It is in the year 2000. We went to Egypt. In the year yeah. 2000. Or was it even 2001? It may have been 2001, which is even more insane because it was. It would have been the summer before September 11th. Mm, right. But we went to Egypt. You can't, I mean, you would not take a senior trip to Egypt now. Um, what, what did you all do in Egypt? Was, um, it, was it an odyssey? The pyramids. I went to, you know, when you see the three pyramids, I went to the little small one. I went all. Well, so there wasn't a lot of space in the no, odyssey. It was. Um, in 2001. Uh, let's see what else did I do. Pyramid, we did a pyramid. Nile riverboat cruise. Yeah. Um, I saw a, a large monolith kind of in the middle of, yeah, isn't that from 2001 a Space Odyssey? Yeah, oh, okay, good, uh, a monkey using yeah, a, bone, using a, bone a monkey a, 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 threw a, a, a spaceship yeah. in the air. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, I wasn't very clear on what was happening in that film. <laughs> All right, Herodotus, <laughs> this is we're off to a great start. Okay, we are talking about Herodotus, this always bodes well. Uh, and again, I'm, I've somehow drawn, drawn the straw of doing the last episode of our <laughs> recording session. So, uh, and we've been working all day. It's like yeah, eight o'clock. Would yeah. you prefer it if I only half listened and then chimed in with something off topic? You mean the way that you normally do? What do you? Oh, I was saying the way that you guys ruined my intro. <laughs> Did we ruin it? Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we are continuing on with Herodotus. AJ has, wait, I'm waiting for the witty retort. No, it's fine. No Move repost. On. Okay. So uh, we talked in, this is this is our third episode talking about Herodotus. So we're covering his histories. The Our first episode, we talked about this um, conversation between Croesus and Solon that set up this discussion of what is happiness, who is the happiest of men. We then talked about Cyrus, and we kind of made some references to there are these different views of Cyrus. He's, he's often called Cyrus the Great, but... I call him Cyrus the pee-pee kid. Uh, yes, because Cyrus Cyrus's mom, there was a prophecy that involved her peeing and it flooding all of Asia. It's really weird. You should go back and listen to that. Um, all the weird... Well, I'm, I'm saving the weird parts for our Patreon episode. There are lots of weird parts in this section that I, I don't feel comfortable sharing with everyone. So if you want to listen to those, patreon.com slash classical stuff. But boy... This, this Herodotus guy is weird. So for all the best tea, all the hot yes. takes. Uh, yes, we will spill the tea in the in between. I hate this so much. Okay. Uh, but so before I go into this, this episode, um, there are a few different titles given to Herodotus. We, I think I've focused more on the positive of him as father of history. Um, his The word history is like the title of this book. It, he's talking about observations that he's making. Um, so he's kind of establishing this field of history. Um, there's another title given to him. Do you, have you all heard this title before? He's Mm. also sometimes called the father of something else. Chaos. I don't know. (laughs) Father time. Uh, father of lies is the other title given to Herodotus. Cause he's spinning that web. Well, yes. well, because he's he's selecting what goes in history and what yes, doesn't go in that history. That part is true, and also we've only covered it a little bit in the first two books. He's in the first, or I'm sorry, in the first two episodes, which is the first book collectively of Herodotus. So in those, he's talking about kind of um, Greek adjacent. He's talking about um, Lydia, which is kind of 
it, it, anyway, he's talking about like local stories and local gods. And so when he's kind of exaggerating, it's not really a problem because he's kind of bringing in Greek mythology to his story of Greece. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. his, um, him going over the top isn't really a problem in that way. Um, but there are portions of the book and this book is one of them where, uh, there are lots of things that are just incorrect. And so, uh, that he would have known about. Well, that's, I think the question, and we'll go through that as we, as we kind of go through these stories. So he will put in to this book, things that are not true about Egypt. And some of them are because he's trying to like get one in on the Egyptians and like prove why, you know, Halicarnassus, which is where he's from, why, you know, or the Greeks, why the Greeks are better than the Egyptians. Some of them are, he's just including everything that he has heard. So this, um, he doesn't mean this as a defense of himself, but ha halfway through book two, he, he'll say, um, uh, well then let the, let these accounts told by the Egyptians be put to use by anyone who finds such things credible. My entire account is governed by the rule that I write down precisely what I am told by everyone just as I heard it. So there's this element of, is he being told incorrect things? Is he intentionally putting in incorrect things? Um, or is, Herodotus just like a really gullible guy. Mm. And that's, you know, as we go through this, you can kind of pick whichever so he's, one. He's just retweeting. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So he, a story comes his way. And you got to think that the the project he's setting out to do of like connecting the known world and talking between them is like a really difficult thing to be doing. This project hasn't existed before. Um, so, you know, my main, my main takeaway from most of this is he's doing a really good thing. He's trying to give an objective account of all these different people groups all over the, again, known world. Um, like, yeah, but there are limits to what he's able to do. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's the question of, is he maliciously incorporating these things or is he just mistaken? And that's, we can go through this. Well, what kind of lies are we talking about? Is it like, I hear all the Egyptians eat poop. And it's like, all right, <laughs> well, better write it down. Weirdly enough, most of them will end up being pro Egypt, um, things that he puts into his stories. Um, we'll get into them later, but like, um, there's, I'll get into them later, gotcha. but Sorry. so that's why it, I think each one is different in what kind of mistake it is. But just to know that not everyone is like really rah rah Herodotus. Not mm -hmm. everyone looks at this book and thinks this is a great project he set out to do, because in some ways he's like biased us, uh, or at least biased the ancient world toward the Egyptians in certain ways gotcha. based on the book that he did, and that. And maybe it's an open question, you know, father of inaccuracies versus father of lies. Maybe that would be the question. But that father of lies title is one that's pretty common. For Sketchier, him. too. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. Father of inaccuracies is last time. Not as good, that's, which is why yeah. no one calls him yeah. that. But I think that is Plutarch that calls him the father of lies Whoa. and Cicero who calls him the father of history. So you'll get this, again, it just depends on who you ask. Yeah, Plutarch, super, uh, you know super buttoned down on his history. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> Plutarch recorded some stuff. Is it, you just mean stuff that clearly didn't happen? I mean, I don't know. To call him, to say like he's the father of lies and then you wrote like a book that you're like shoehorning two people into comparisons. I don't know. I mean, I love Plutarch. Plutarch's great. But it's, it's like, check yourself, Plutarch. Yeah. The gods had war in the heavens and blood drizzled on the capital the night before Caesar died. So yeah. either that actually happened or Plutarch is taking a little bit of extra fun. Is that what he said? Yeah. That's hardcore, man. Dude, the, all kinds of stuff happened the night before Caesar died. Oh, that's like but a finished the, death metal album. Yes. <laughs> but again, Blood on the capital? Oh. But th this is terrifying. Uh, that's so metal. Is that the right thing to say like you? You're crushing it. But that's, again, we talked about this forever ago, is the question of like, what is history? And that's where... Herodotus will even be, you know, in book one, we saw him bring in these kind of mystical, magical elements of, you know, Apollo literally intervening. Is that history? Yeah. And that's kind of, and again, that's, do you call that he's just recording the event as he heard it, or he's lying because he wants to incorporate these Greek gods? That's, that's kind of the question you get as you go through this. I only bring this up going into it because I think chapter two is chapter two where he talks about Egypt. So we ended chapter, um, book one talking about Cyrus. Cyrus is very briefly mentioned at the beginning of book two and then not mentioned again until book three. So this is like not a Cyrus chapter right now, which is a slight bummer because I, or, or, I'm sorry, Cyrus is dead at this point. Um, like the Persian line is not discussed gotcha. in this book is what I meant to say. Um, he is very much focused on Egypt, mostly because the Persians will invade Egypt. That's what happens in book three. So he's kind of, you know, this is Herodotus's chance to talk about a, a region that a lot of people in Greece wouldn't have been to before. That's kind of what he's going for. Okay. So I'm going to just cover some of the highlights of this 
section. It's super long. So the previous two episodes I did covered maybe 40 pages of the book. And there's, there's a lot of dense story happening in, in those. And they both justified an episode. This is about a hundred pages and I'm only going to do one episode on it. So there's just like a lot of background and it talks about geography. There's just a lot of stuff that's not interesting to bring to a podcast. So I'm not going to go through it. If you want to read it, then more power to you. Okay. So we start off uh, talking about the Egyptians and the Egyptians as a people have been in on their, in their land much longer than the Greeks have been in their land. And um, whoever the Egyptian, he'll talk, he'll use, you know, King, Pharaoh, leader, like those terms will be used kind of interchangeably. There are lots of times where Herodotus will use Greek gods to reference Egyptian gods. He's very clearly using his Greek background as his way of understanding the Egyptians. So when I say king, just you can translate that into Pharaoh. So I shouldn't be well actually. You, you can okay. if you want to, but you would be well actually. Um, Herodotus. Horus. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. And that one, Anyway, and part of that, I don't know how much is translation versus what Herodotus actually wrote. Because gotcha. the translator every time will correct Herodotus, basically, to say, he means this god. Um, but whoever the leader at the time is wants to figure out which people group is the oldest. And uh, it's, this is an Egyptian, wants the answer to be Egypt. And so he needs to find a way to figure out who the oldest people group is. What does he do to figure that out? Ooh, like, great. what are ways to figure out who the oldest people are? Who's got the oldest furniture. Okay, good. Yeah. So you just, you go find all their chairs and you're like, oh, this one, slightly older. Yeah. I mean, you could look at their relics. Who has the, okay. I mean, every every society puts up monuments, right? And so you could check check the monuments, which yes. ones have been preserved for a long time. You could also look at, I mean, there's any number of ways. You could look at linguistics. Yes. See if you can find older versions of, of their language. Language changes at, you know, a certain rate. And then you can look at, oh, pfft. You can check out their cities back then. If a city got destroyed, they'd just rebuild it. So think of how many layers down you can go. Check out their catacombs. Be, these you are good count, count your dead people. Just go to the graveyard uh, and be like, one, who has two, more? three, four, five. Like, just count uh, uh, and see who's got more sure. and um, see which one, which graves look older. Uh, this guy does none of those things. Mm. He takes two kids and uh, children, like because um, kid, 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 kid can mean goat also. Yep. But he takes babies, uh, baby humans, and they are raised by themselves. So they're baby humans, and they're raised essentially in like a, a shed. And every day, a goat comes in to give them some milk, and someone comes in to like take care of the kid, but no one can speak to the kid. And so they do this for two years. These two kids, and then after two years, they start talking. Finally, the kids do. The kids start talking. Well, they speak in goat. Well, the question is, what's their first word? And their first word is... Be- Egypt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Their first word is bakos. Bakos is their first word. There's no reason you should know what this means. Bakos is the Phrygian word for bread. And from this, the Egyptians are able to figure out, actually, the Phrygians have been around longer than they have. Like, oh, because they're the, they're the default setting. Yes. So if you don't do anything else to a human, they're going to start speaking in this Phrygian language. Fa- mm. Factory settings. Yes, there you exactly. go. Yep. yep. Reset the phone. Yes. Which language? Why would you have to do two kids? Yeah, that's a great question. I want to say uh, one's, a, was, one's a control. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, <laughs> I don't okay. think that's quite yeah. how that works because he's doing the same science, same treatment of both. But um, I think he takes one Egyptian and one Phrygian and then tests them both to see which one they do, and both of them say Bekos. Both of them have that as their first word. What's a Phrygian? Uh, just a different people group, large boxy human. Mm. Uh, yeah, they look like a fridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, refrigerator. So the, from the they use Freon. Uh, is, yeah, it's yeah. pretty important to them. So. It turns out the Egyptians are, have not been there the longest. So there's your bummer start to the story, which again gives you this kind of sense. Was of, there a competition? Oh, like, did their little Phrygian there sneak was in? Nothing. Was like, bread, 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 bread. <laughs> there was nothing on the line. And which, if the kids were together, of course they're going to stay the same. The race, no, the race separately. They oh, both separately. Had their own, they both had their and they own both shed. said they both said Ooh, Yeah, that's pretty compelling. That's compelling. Is that's it? A good, no, that's please there's no this. other. There's, I can't really think of any other. It's just reason, science. Any other, yeah. yeah, this is this is that thing like when Socrates says something and the answer is uh, how can it be otherwise? How can it be otherwise? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. obvious. That's uh, clearly all the evidence that you need. Okay, so this proves, but the point still is that the Egyptians have been around longer than the Greeks have, and so Herodotus is interested in a few things. First is the this will sound silly, but he's he's like wondering how, like why is Egypt covered in sand while Greece is not? That's that's one way of him putting it. I've never thought about it. My wait, mind wait. is blown. Well, it's just like, why does one place look different than another place? Is is one way to say it. Do you do you, do you have any guesses for why one looks different than the other? Uh, the Egyptian Egypt was the source for most of the marble for the world, and so as they crush the marble, it just hmm. makes a lot of dust. That's good. That's a good answer. Do you want... They're further south. 
Yeah, so it could just be like a literally where yeah. you are in the world. So the answer Herodotus comes to, and I, I don't know the validity. I, I have not looked into this one, so apologies. Um, his theory is that um, Egypt used to be a marsh. So instead of it being a desert, it used to be covered in water, and it used to be marshy. And he gets to this because... You know, if you ever if you've ever seen a creek bed and it and it and it, all the water evaporates, there's kind of this like sandy, dusty yeah, material right. left over. I think it's effluvium. I forget the word for it, but there's there's some technical word for it. It's it's what sedentary rock is made up made of. Is this kind of again sandy, rocky, uh, grainy material? Well, that's what it looks like all over Egypt, right? Mm. And so his theory is that there used to be these marshes everywhere, and then over time the water has receded, and now you get. The, the desert and the um, rivers, right? The water has just kind of moved to be over in the rivers. I mean, he's probably on some. He could be. And he, he, he'll he talk about these stories of like ancient uh, Egyptian kings that they have stories of there being much more water than there is now. There you go. So yes, there's the, the Nile, okay. but there used to be more um, that when Egypt was first founded, there's only this one little plot of land that counted as Egypt. And then over time, that land has expanded. And that's him saying that that's the water receding. So if Egypt's full of sand, why is Greece full of... Like rocky hills. That is a, so he takes as the quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, regular land is the Greek oh, land. And I then see. like, why is Egypt different gotcha. is, is really his framing device for it, yeah. which again, I'm not going to go into it because he repeats it a thousand times, but he'll, he can only think of the gods in terms of the Greek names for the gods. And then, well, the Egyptians have a version of this God also. Um, he's always starting with the Greek version and then translating that into Egypt. Um, so same with even the land. Mm-hmm. So why is Egypt different than Greece? Well, it used to be a marshy. It used to be a marsh, and then it, the water has receded over time, and now it looks the way that it does. Um, this ties in then with Egypt has been around for a very long time for it to go from, you know, a verdant marsh to, um, yes, there are places that do grow a lot and have a lot of water, but most of it doesn't. A lot of it is really deserty. Well, Herodotus will trace the development of the gods in Egypt that – thousands and thousands of years ago, they had eight gods. And then about 3000 years ago, they went to 12 gods. And those 12 gods, weirdly enough, line up with um, all the main Greek gods. I don't have the list in front of me, but these 12 are represented in the Greek pantheon. And so what Herodotus puts forth here is that the Greeks get their gods from Egypt, that because Egypt is an older people group, uh, the names have changed, but the functions are, are largely the same. Um, there are many stories that are similar between them, and there are, are appearances of the gods that are similar between them. So what's that god growth rate? It was uh, yes. 8 to 12 in how many years? Uh, uh, so 3,000 years ago is when 12 got added, and he'll the later posit that Egypt is 10,000 years old. So oh, okay. 7,000 years with 8 gods, and then 3,000 years with 12 gods. So we should be around 13 now. Yeah, we should, that, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I wonder when we add one. So I don't know if it's a percentage or if it's just the number. Yeah, or if there's inflation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's Hinduism. Yeah. uh, But the Greek pantheon is also pretty large in in its own right. It's not 12. It's more than 12. I think. Oh, yeah. They got a lot more than that. That's the part that is a little weird. He's talking about, like, the main gods. Mm. Um, But, AJ, this seems more your alley around ancient history and, like, again, Greek pantheon. Is there anything – do you – is that something you've come across, this connection between Egyptian – gods and the greek gods not yet okay yeah i don't know that's it it i haven't looked into the origins of the pantheons but is this post alexander the great or pre-alexander the great herodotus because hellenization happened and then everyone was like oh yeah we're actually all greek uh let's see 356 bc so this is pre so we're not in ptolemaic egypt yeah okay um so that's a thing he'll point to, and he's not, like, bitter about this. This is just an observation he makes. It's a theory he has. He can't really prove this, but he'll repeatedly throughout this section point to stories that are common be- between the two, mm. which, uh, again, I'm not going to, like, go into the all the details on that. But it's an interesting thing, and he's not mad about this, or he's not critical about this. Um, Herodotus will often be accused of being too pro-Greek, but he's – He's seeming to kind of weigh the evidence here and say this is a thing that could have happened. Um, again, I don't know that I don't know whether that's true or not. And there are lots of there are other places we'll go to where we see that Herodotus is actually wrong about what he proposes. But this is something he says. Um, okay, so a we won't go too into it, but a question that Herodotus is very interested in. I won't go into that. He he asks why the Nile floods in the summer as opposed to during the spring. Um, 
and he proposes three theories and he shoots all of them down. <laughs> and it turns out one of the three theories is actually the right one. Oh yeah. But he calls it like a clearly wrong theory. Um, so this is where something that really helped me to get through this section is that the translator is like, like, um, making fun of Herodotus on like mm-hmm. every other page. So, uh, Herodotus will propose a theory. Um, uh, he calls it in fact, the most erroneous of the three. And then, um, the translator will say, actually, this is the most likely of the three. <laughs> so there's kind of this like back and forth between Herodotus kind of, uh, goes over. He's, uh, he's too certain about an opinion of his and he's actually wrong. And, uh, and the, the translator will like poke fun at him throughout, which I, I find very charming. It's one of the, yeah, it, it's one of the reasons to pick up this landmark version as opposed to other translations. The translator is like very much engaging with this, with this work. So he's the father of being wrong. Then. Yes, but again, it's like how to what degree could he have known that he was wrong? That's true. So he's talking about the you know why again he assumes that all rivers should flood at the same time because he's from Greece, and so he assumes that like that weather pattern holds, and there's not really a reason that it should. Um, uh, it's just the snow in the region melts at different times is what it comes down to. And like, how, how would he have known that? Um, so there are some that it's easy to forgive him on and others that are not, let's get to one that it's maybe less easy to forgive him on. Um, so he, you all know about Egyptians and cats. What do you know about Egyptians and cats? They mummify them. They love their cats. Mm -hmm. They worship them as a God. Maybe first society to establish a stackable cat. Stackable cat. cat. Yeah, stack, stack them high. What? Like nine cats high. Explain. What are you <laughs> Please don't take me seriously. No. <laughs> I was like, are you making things up? <laughs> oh, we mummify them so we can stack mm. them high? Is that the reason we're doing just, this? Okay. Just, mm-hmm. uh, so, stackable cats. Yes. Well, speaking of stackable cats, uh, so Herodotus will recount how Egyptians keep household cats and talk about the grieving that occurs in the house when the like house cat dies. He contrasts that to the view of when you know, what does the family do when a house dog dies? How those are different? Well, Egyptians never, they did not domesticate or they didn't keep cats in their house the way that he's describing. This is not a thing that actually happened. Hmm. I'll, I'll just read it from the translator. These, these anecdotes are quite untrue. Um, there, uh, there were no domestic cats in Greece. Um, so his ignorance or gullibility here and that of the Greek audience can perhaps be forgiven. So that's, again, he's, he sees this kind of elevation of um, Egyptian cats and then he'll kind of expand that story more than more than maybe he should have. Um, again, gullibility maybe should be could be forgiven. He'll talk about another animal after this. He'll talk about crocodiles. This is another thing that uh, um, Herodotus has probably not seen before. Uh, let me read you this description of a crocodile and tell me if you find anything funny about this. The nature of the crocodile is such that it eats nothing during the four winter months. It has four feet and lives both on dry land and in the water. Although it lays and hatches its eggs on land and generally spends the greater part of the day on dry ground, it stays in the river all night since the water is warmer than the open air and the dew. Of all mortal creatures we know, this one grows from the smallest to the largest size, for its egg is not much larger than that of a goose. Where is his physical descriptions? It has the eyes of a pig, enormous teeth. Yeah, we're going off the rails here. And tusks proportional to its body. And it alone of all... Tusks? Yeah. And it alone of all animals has no tongue. Nor does it move its lower jaw, but it is the only animal that brings its upper jaw down to meet its lower jaw. I mean, I, I get what he's saying. Well, tell me. So what is, what is he trying to say? He's, or what, like, what's wrong about this? Um, well, when you look at a crocodile, like it looks like it looks like the upper jaw is the thing that's moving because you know you got the the crocodile shape, the like, V mouth. Yeah, sure. That chomp. That uh, I don't know about the tongue thing. Never really thought about it. Yeah. Then the then the pelican. How like the you know big big gullet bird thing have like a top that comes off like more like a, like a convertible, <laughs> just like a convertible. <laughs> I mean like they got a they got a top hinged mouth same yeah, kind yeah. of way right. That's true. Yeah, they scoop up all the fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You can't really that lower hinge. Um, that's true. And they yeah. Um, don't they like bleed on their kids to feed them? The pelicans do. No, is, that's, is that that's pelicans? An, that's an old myth. I think it's a different. Um. So do crocodiles have tusks that are proportional they don't have to the tusks. size? They don't of have their pig body? eyes. Although, would, you call, would you call them pig eyes if you're I mean, looking? I don't at know. Maybe eyes? I guess. Yeah. Kind of I never gotten. I never looked at yeah. crocodile in the eye before. Uh, they do. They have a tongue. Nice. That's a great question. I was. I've been thinking. Oh, I have no do, idea. Do any of you guys know? They have a tongue. Oh, doggone it! I was gonna. You can gonna say play a quiz game. You think they have or they do have a tongue? Oh, 
I was gonna say we should we should take oh, wagers and then Google sorry. it. Oh, they have a tongue. Sorry, adventure ruined. So the, the tongue is fixed in place. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like if you're so part of it is like so Herodotus does Herodotus want to spend a ton of time looking at crocodiles? Probably not. So what does he do? Probably asks a couple of people, "Hey, can you describe them to me?" And then he writes it down. <laughs> if your tongue is fixed in place, do you have a tongue? Yes. He? I think you just he got like a, a, a fleshy he? jaw. But if it's well, fixed yeah. in place. But uh, humans yeah, have a, you just have like a you just have, have a, tongue, a they have a tongue tie under there. So imagine if your tongue tie extended, you'd still have a tongue. But if it's but if it's fixed and you can't w- wobble it around, that doesn't make a tongue. Whatever. So sure, maybe Herodotus is right on that one. But on the other ones, he's not. The pig eye is a weird description. The tusk is a weird description. Um, and it's one of those things where you're like, did Herodotus actually look at a crocodile? I feel like you just asked the old guy down by the river. Yes. They got tusks and no tongue. Like, oh, they really? got a jaw. Yeah. Flips open at the top. Yeah. This is more egregious with this final example, the hippopotamus. Uh, oh, no. So the, I didn't know this. Hippopotamus, do you know what that means? The, like the Greek word hippopotamus literally means? From hippo? Horse of the river. Oh. Horse of the river. Hmm. Hippopotamus. Uh, I can he, see it. Oh, well, yeah, like hippodrome. Uh, the hippopotamus is thought to be sacred by the people of um, this region, but not but not by the Egyptians. So by sacred by one region, but not by the region of Egypt. This is what it looks like. It has four feet with cloven hooves like an ox, a blunt snout, a mane like a horse, conspicuous tusks, and a horse's tail. It neighs. It is the size of the largest ox, and its hide is so thick that once it is dried, spear shafts are crafted from it. Is there anything weird about that description of a hippopotamus? Hippo spears? Hippo spear is weird. I don't totally get that. It Why not? Nays? Nays? You Does tell me what it a hippo na- sounds it like. Says, you said it nays. nays. It nays. Do it, they nay? No. No, they don't nay. So he, what, what is he describing? A horse. He's describing water. a horse. He's describing a literal horse that goes into water, and he's calling that hippopotamus. That is literally the name, hippopotamus, but that's not what a hippo looks like, right? <laughs> it, it, to describe it as an ox, do you know, what is the difference between an ox and a hippo? Like if you were to describe a hippo as opposed to an ox, what's different about the hippo? Um, they don't, the have, water they like don't a horse. have They don't have tusks. Yeah. They just don't have tusks, I don't think. Oh, they totally have tusks. They have tusks. Oh, do they? All yeah. Right, well, then. I, but I would say, like, you know, the ox has fur. Swainamus for me. It's, you're, you're, doing, you're doing okay over there, Herodotus. Um, but, like, the hippo has no fur would be, like, your first obvious compare. If you're going to say it's yeah. the yeah, size it of an ox. Yeah, it doesn't have the mane. Right. Um, and also, um, you would say it's fatter than an ox. Like, he doesn't, like, the thing he doesn't comment on is, like. It fatter than an ox? I don't know, man. Oxes are pretty broad. But they're not, like, rotund in the way. I'm maybe I'm too in the weeds on this one. The point I'm saying is that his description of a crocodile, you can kind of understand what he's referencing, mm-hmm. but it's still not right. Mm-hmm. And his hippo one is even further from the truth where it's like, uh, I think you're literally describing a horse that goes into water. That's what that sounds yeah. like you're describing. I don't see no mane. Yeah. I'm trying to get to the bottom of this whole horse tail business. Cause it has a tail, but I wouldn't call it a horse tail. Cause it does not, not look like a horse. Horse tails are long and flowy. This thing is kind of short and stubby and goofy looking like it's a not furry, like a horse tail. Right? No, it's yeah, that's not. the other part. So furry. Yeah, like a horse tail is furry, but a hippo tail is not. Hmm. Furry? I mean, like, we need to go to a zoo. Yeah, we have classical majestic. stuff at the zoo. That would actually, let's do that for Patreon. Um, the I'll just read the translator's comment because it's one of those charming ones. So again, I already told you, the Greek hippopotamus literally means horse of the river. It is obvious from this description of the animal that Herodotus never saw one. Right, and I, <laughs> Which is like a great dig at the thing you're translating. Uh, so that's where we get into this. So the, the thing I read you at the beginning of I'm just going to write down everything I was told comes halfway through the story. We're still at the point where Herodotus is presenting this as if he saw all this stuff. And this is what he saw during his trip to Egypt. And it comes, it just, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like he's lying is what I'm trying to say. It sounds like he's presenting as I saw a crocodile and a hippo. This is what they look like. It's not what they actually look like. You don't seem so. It feels a little unfair. Say more. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, maybe where was the last vacation that you took, that you went to? The last place you flew to? Flew to? Yeah. I haven't flown since I had a child, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. So think back. Uh, I can't even think of where it was. Uh, can I just say, like, a, a trip I remember is a trip to New York. Can okay, so that? you went to New York. Yeah. Can you, like, tell me all the build? Can you, like, draw Times Square? Uh, poorly, but sure, I could. Isn't that, my, isn't that the point? No, it's fair. It's yes. like he saw one hippo 
on yes. like his on the big double decker yes. bus, and he was like, "Whoa, right. crazy!" And then later on, he was trying to describe it, yes. and he got a couple details. But wrong. even if he saw one hippo, my first thought wouldn't be that looks like a horse. <laughs> like that's not the hippo one. I think is the crocodile one. I could see him miss seeing what that is. The hippo one, he literally is describing a horse that swims in water. Like that one. That one seems more sketchy than the. You're looking this up right now. I also looked up pictures. It is very clearly not a horse. Yes, that's the the weird part. It, to the point that the name is weird. That he called like, why would you call that the horse of the water when it doesn't even really look like a horse? I think that one's weird. But I take your point. I'm also not presenting myself as like putting together the first history to accurately present what's happening in the world. But I take your point that it's easy to forget things. Herodotus maybe gets more attention than I would for my misrememberings of my trip to New York. So I think that's a fair point, but also, uh, the thing I'm more concerned about is, is he lying? Is he presenting something as I saw this and this is what it looked like, but actually he didn't as opposed to he misremembered. Is that distinction clear? Yeah. Yeah. Have yeah, I, it sure feels like he's really glossing over some stuff there. Have you been won over to the father of lies side yet? No, I feel like we should give him the benefit of the doubt. I mean, it's just a really strong name. Yeah. I think occasional liar, cousin, cousin of lies, cousin of lies. Good. Father of lies, man, you got to, you, you birthed them all. Sure. And of course that title is just because he gets the title father of history. It's, it's just to be a mirror image of that. I feel like you can have both that father of history, cousin of lies. Good. I like this. Good. I don't, I, I, th- th- this family seems messed up, but yes, I, that's probably closer to it. Yeah. But again, the question is how much of it is a lie? How much of this is, he just got some stuff wrong. And I think you can, again, we'll, we'll go through a couple more of these. Compared to some of the like medieval historians yes. that talk about, uh, people like yeah. there's some medieval historians that say, yeah, I saw this one guy. He's just a giant foot. Like he's one big foot. <laughs> With eyes. Are you trying to say that's not true? I don't understand. What are those little puddlians, right? That sounds right. Um, so, little, I mean, I mean, come you, on. You know that he met that guy in a pub. They had a disagreement, and he's like, just wait till, wait till you see what I do to <laughs> you I, in what, my what history. You, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Name was Gregory, just a giant foot. Gregory's like, oh, man, shouldn't have taken those 20 bucks off him at the pool table. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the other is that the medieval history has a view of time that is not linear, and Herodotus does have a view of time that's linear. Yeah. So his, his series of events occur one after the other, as opposed to a medieval one that's like in the summer these things have happened in the fall these things have happened and they're out of out of order in terms of like year after year so that does that's to Herodotus's credit that it is easy to read it's easy to, it's easy to understand literally what's happening scene to scene uh, there's a um, there's an example of here of the Egyptian form of memento mori I won't go through it but you know Herodotus is identifying and seeing things that are, are common between the Greeks and the Egyptians. He has this weird part where he is shown the history of, I think 300 Kings, Pharaohs, 300 Kings, 300 leaders of Egypt. And his, like he, 330, there are 330 names of Kings of Egypt. He reads through all their stories. And his takeaway is that none of them are that great. And that none of them had like anything that's worth repeating in his book. Um, uh, None of the others accomplished a thing is the is the quote that he has in here. So I feel like that's going to the redwoods and being like just a bunch of trees. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like so he'll later talk about how like the Egyptians have existed for ten thousand years and the Greeks have not. But he's like, yeah, they you know they've been around for longer, but they didn't do anything with it, right? Like you know, in, you know, the Greeks have done so much, and they're you know thousand years or whatever. Um, oh man, I'm rolling my eyes so yes, hard here. You if you're, yes, if you're not watching on YouTube. Um, what I need to figure out is I need to do a zoom in on for your eye roll. Well, yeah, we can do this. It's, it's better with YouTube because you, we can't see the bottom half of your face. So literally all anyone can see is your eye roll. As I'll just add a neck movement. Through. Yeah, this is even better. Um, there, there's one queen in this history of 330 who he talks about and thinks is great. But the other, the Kings are, I believe as AJ would say derps. So he has nothing to say about them. The he'll later talk about these, two areas of Egypt that he thinks are related to each other, that he thinks that Egyptian people moved from Egypt to this uh, area in Asia called Colchis. He'll talk about how there's this similarity between the way that they make linen. And from that, he draws that they must have a common ancestor. And again, the translator makes sense. The translator, (laughs) I feel like the way they're figuring out who the ancestors are, it's just like throw some noodles at the wall and see what sticks. Kids said bread. 
Yep. Phrygians yes. are the oldest. Yep. They got some similar clothes. Yep. Must, yeah, common ancestors. Yeah. Those babies made linen the same way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, uh, the, the translator's comment is, this identification of Egyptians with Colkins is, of course, entirely wrong. So it's just a, <laughs> it's just a great burn at uh, Herodotus. Okay, so we get through some of those mistakes there. Um, this, was, this one's interesting. So he'll talk about Helen and Paris. Uh, the translator here is Alexandros, but I'll say Paris because that's what I'm used to. Uh, apparently there are stories about Helen and Paris going to Egypt. Is this the thing that you've come across? That is a thing. Yeah. Do you, can you say more about that? Oh, what was it? Legend has it that Helen was absconded to Egypt and the Helen of that was at Troy I'm, is not was, the same. was a fake? Yeah. Was so, like a, a mirage yeah. Helen? Well, so this one... Right, that's right. Well, this one will say that Helen, so like the Helen who they're fighting the Trojan War over, is actually in Egypt the whole time. Yes, and, and that she's not there. And so what Herodotus says is that there's actually no Helen in Troy at all. So there's this fight going on. It's a on. false flag. Yeah. This is like InfoWars uh, uh, <laughs> ancient world. Yeah, sure. Inside job! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's an inside job! <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do think his thinking on this is interesting. So the, the version of the story he tells is that so way back part one of the book, like three pages in he talks, he, he, the Paris and Helen story is there. So, but he, but Herodotus's version of it is in the context of this kind of like, what if I told you Helen wasn't in Troy? Look, I don't, this is the worst. Um, his version is that there's this, uh, kidnapping going back and forth between different people groups. Paris is like, Hey, I could do that. And so he, he goes off to Sparta, right? Isn't that where, is it Menelaus? Is that yep, Spartans? Yeah. So he goes off to Sparta, st- steals Helen. Well, he stays with Menelaus and Helen and then steals his stuff and steals Helen. So Paris is much more a bad guy. In the um, Homer version, does Paris steal stuff? They don't, in Homer's version, they don't even really dwell on what happened. It? Okay. It's just, he is an outlaw and yep. it's mostly because, I mean, Menelaus is a little, he seems to be less incensed about Helen and more incensed about the dishonor of yes. having someone stay at his house. Yes. And so he, he actually plans to kill Helen when he yes. finds her. But, he ends up not doing that uh, at, at one point. She's yeah. not there. Well, that's the other part of it. Yeah, that was, in Egypt the whole time. Yeah. Well, okay. So the version here is that so uh, Paris steals Helen. Well, Helen kind of runs off with him. It's you know a lot's going on, but also Aphrodite she, makes her love stupid. But not in this version. So but not in that version. Yeah, oh, in man. this version, Helen Been there. wants to go. What? Uh, you jumped on a boat and accidentally. Ah, <laughs> um, oh, poor Pip. <laughs> the worst. Yeah. Um, so Paris. Uh, abducts Helen, who, or she kind of goes along. Also, they steal some of Menelaus' stuff. They get on a boat and they start um, riding away. Uh, Menelaus tries to go after him, but he, I think he's like late to figuring it out and can't go after them for some reason. Well, then there's this wind that throws them off course. And instead of going back to Troy, which is where um, Paris is going to, I guess, uh, they're knocked off to Egypt. Um, and it's so- the wind. Jeez. What, that's the th- so when you look at a map, you're like, this doesn't really make a ton of sense, but here we are. It's like Odysseus claiming yes. that wind blew him all over the place. It's yeah. like, man, you just sailed there. You clearly just wanted to go hang out with Those, uh, those boats have oars, yeah, man. Yeah, you, you don't have to just follow the wind. Yeah, exactly. No, but it's a really strong wind. Herodotus, is ma- uh, make sure to, to make sure you know that. Um, and when he goes, so when this happens, they're redirected to Egypt accidentally because of the wind. And it so happens that the leader of Egypt at this time is a um, uh, is a Greek named Proteus. Now, how did he get there? This objectively never happened. This version of events comes from a poem by Homer. So Herodotus is u- using a poem by Homer to kind of make up some historical events that Proteus was not was not actually a king of Egypt. Is is what the translator notes tell me. Uh, maybe maybe we'll get well actually. But um, so so. First off, there's like we we talked about this during the AMA. Did the Trojan War actually happen? Well, in the context of this, like none of this happened because this king was never king in Egypt, and there's questions of um, Helen and and Paris existing. Anyway. Is he pulling this nonsense from the Odyssey? Not the Proteus part. Proteus is from a different poem. Is Proteus in? Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, what is Menelaus? So Odysseus stops, or Telemachus stops at Menelaus's house, and he's like, "Hey, can you tell me about my dad? Do you know what happened?" And Menelaus tells this really long story about he was blown off course nope. when they were heading home from Troy, ended up, I think, through Egypt, and then the only way he could get home was by tackling the old man of the sea, Proteus. Oh, oh no. So this is like a, a dude named Proteus in this story. And then he, he hugged him, and he changed shapes a whole bunch, and then he asked him, 
what happened to everybody? And then the guy says the stuff. So, I think it's Proteus. So in this one, it's a king of Egypt named Proteus. It's a fiction based on the ancient Greek poet Homer. So look, look, this is where things get fun. I'll keep going with this version, but you, you keep looking it up too. Um, so Proteus is the king there. Um, Helen and Paris are knocked off, off track. They make it yeah. to Egypt. Did, did you find I'm it? right. Proteus. Yeah, the, but Proteus Old is Old man of the sea, hugged by Odysseus. Or hugged by Menelaus. But he's not a dude. He's a god. Yeah, sea or like a river, a water god. Creature, yeah, yeah. This one is not. He's literally just like the king of Egypt. So he's saying he took the story of Proteus from the yes the Odyssey and was like, I'm going to cook says, up a king from it. This just says from Homer. It doesn't the the note specifically doesn't say Odyssey. But I don't know of any other Homeric okay. poems besides Iliad and Odyssey. I maybe I'm just uninformed. I don't, I don't know. You're very well informed. No, you're crushing it. Um, so they get knocked off course to Egypt. Um, some well. What they find out is that in Egypt, there is this shrine to Heracles. No, shrine to, shrine to a Greek god, a uh, sanctuary of Heracles. There's a sanctuary of Heracles and that anyone who goes to the sanctuary can go there. And if they choose to serve the shrine, they will be forgiven of their crimes and they can stay there without being killed. Mm, sweet deal. Yes. So all of the people on the boat with Paris and Helen go run to that shrine and are like, Hi, we don't want to be a, be a part of this horrible thing that uh, Paris is doing. What you just said of staying with this guy and then stealing his wife and a bunch of their wealth. So they don't want to. They don't want a part of that. They run to the shrine. They tell them. They tell the priests all this stuff, and the priests pass this on to Proteus. And Proteus says that he needs to see Paris and Helen because he needs this Paris guy to die. But what's the? Um, what do they have to do to get out of? Uh, being part of the crime. Do you have to like they clean serve the temple? The, yeah, yeah, they, they, they basically dedicate their lives to that temple. So the priest can say things like, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the garden needs weeds and uh, there's some dishes in the kitchen, like yes. that kind of thing. And they now have this like whole crew of people who are working there now mm-hmm. that they didn't have before. It's, so it's kind of a good deal for them. So just a quick note. Yes. I was right. Yep. It's it's from the Odyssey. Yeah, there, there are no other poems attributed to Homer other than the Iliad and the Odyssey. But it's weird then because it's not a, this is not a divine figure. This is like just a dude. And the story in the, the Odyssey is so strange. They hide on the beach mm-hmm. in, in the skins of like walruses uh-huh. or seals or walruses. Let's and then they right. wait until he comes up to like hang out with his uh-huh. walrus bros. Then they tackle him. He begins changing shape wildly to try to get away. And he's yeah. like fire and wind and a walrus and all kinds of stuff. And then eventually he sort of gets tired and they're like, all right, what happened to all the Greeks? And then he tells them. It's, that's the story. That's really funny. So that's not, again, that's not what happens here. There's no walrus skins. There's no, none of the beach stuff. And like it's just that. funny that he took that yes. and made that. He basically took the, yeah, he, he took the name basically. Yeah, that's it. So that makes it even more fan fiction-y than it was already, right? So again, this didn't happen because, uh, you know, Proteus was not this leader in Egypt at the time. That's the other part of it. Um, so uh, Paris and Helen are brought to Proteus and Proteus, ex- or, uh, Paris explains everything. Well, Paris lies about what's happened. His crew correct him because they're there to... Classic ac- Paris. Yeah, exactly. To accuse him of what's going on. And Proteus had originally said he was going to kill Paris because this is a horrible thing he did. Uh, Herodotus doesn't say this, but it seems... Basically, he sees Helen and he's like, you know, Paris, I don't want to kill anyone. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't mm. appreciate death. What I'm actually going to do is Helen's going to stay with me. And you're going to uh, leave all the stuff you stole from Menelaus here, and then you can go and, and be on your way. So, you know, he, they don't say. What are you saying, maybe? That are you attributing, uh, are you being cynical? Uh, I'm not, that's not cynical, is it? It's the, re- the reason he spares their lives is because. You Helen's think that's pretty proportional? Pro- ju- proportional justice that he took away the things that Paris no, it's wrong. so desired? Helen is a human who has like just been like passed off from one man to another. Like that's, that's the part true. that is a bummer about the story. Poor Helen. Um, so Helen then is stuck in Egypt is Herodotus's take on the, on what's happening. But Paris doesn't like own up to this. So Menelaus doesn't know that. So Paris leaves, he goes back to, um, to Troy and Menelaus, I'm sorry, Herodotus asserts that Helen was never there. And his reason for that is that no right King Priam would not have been on board for the death of his many sons the you know the 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 um, destruction of his kingdom because of this one lady like if Priam is like a reasonable human he would have given Helen back immediately but since he doesn't 
it's a sign that Helen wasn't there in the first place. Oh, so when Menelaus, Menelaus is like, give me back my wife, yeah. and Prime's like, she's not here. Yeah. Menelaus is like, oh, liar. Yeah, well, or I'm not entirely clear on why Prime couldn't have, couldn't have just said that, but he wouldn't have kept fighting if, like, what's he get out of this whole thing, right? Like, the destruction of his kingdom, ultimately. And there's not really, like, Paris is so clearly in the wrong. Why would a good king stand up for Paris, even, even if he's... Um, it's his boy. Yeah, I know, but that's it's not son. Really. Blood's so prime is blood like a wise, thicker than a water, maybe. He's a royal. Yeah. He's just and then uh, it could be that. That's a yeah. that's a fine reason. But is that so you said that some of that is that's not in the Iliad, is it? Or what the, that that Helen is in Egypt or like is, are these just theories about what's going on? The Helen in Egypt thing, I did read that, but it's where did I see that? I mean, it's not in the Iliad. It's not. It's no, definitely not no, no. in the Iliad. She is present. She's in, I think, chapter two She's of like the Iliad. She's slightly ticked about Paris. Yeah. The other chapter. Yeah, I think it's. No, chapter three. Helen marshals the armies, I think. Or Helen Helen views the champion, something like that. I will say he will. He quotes the Iliad and Odyssey here to make his point that Helen was in. Egypt the entire time. So it's interesting. Is it, is it probably the best? Oh, you don't like this? You know? Oh, no, it's just no. It, she's so clearly in the book. Oh, yes to that. But she apparently has... I'll just read you this because this probably means more to you than it does to me. So the Iliad part is not relevant. The Iliad part is just establishing that she went with Paris. It's from the Odyssey. Homer also mentions this version in the Odyssey in these verses. Such drugs did the daughter of Zeus possess, drugs clever and good given to her by the bedmate of Thon, Polydomna of Egypt, uh, where the grain giving fields bear forth many drugs and once mixed, some bring much good and others much pain. So there's this Egypt connection to the good stuff, the story. Oh, the drugs. Um, she does drug everybody. That's true. And I guess you, you just referenced Helen it. does? Helen does. When Telemachus comes to visit, she tells a whole bunch. Well, that's the thing is it's right after she tells a bunch of stories of her in Troy. Well, Oh, of her and Troy. So that part would be wrong. But she has this drug that she got from Egypt is the point he's making. So yeah, how, did she, how, yes. did she, how did she get that is what he's pointing to. A visit? And, that's a, it, like, and, that's a, and there are lots of ways to answer that question. Right. And then your part about, um, in other verses, Menelaus says to Telemachus, the gods kept me in Egypt, though I yearned to come here, all because I neglected to offer them oxen, hundreds of oxen. And I think that's the story mm-hmm. you just told. But the way Herodotus tells it is that they have this fight in Troy, um, you know, the Spartan or the Menelaus and his crew break into Troy. They win this battle and then find out Helen's not there. Menelaus goes to Egypt. Um, Helen is there. Helen is given back to Menelaus immediately. And then Menelaus just sails on his merry way. That's the version that Herodotus is pointing to and saying is what happened. It's like, it's not a clear yes or no, this happened or not. It's the most compelling part of this chapter is all I'm saying, because it's like, He's very he's very closely reading the Iliad and Odyssey. He's quoting it. Um, he has an interesting take on what's happening in the story. It's just really compelling, and it's like the one part you can't be like he's just wrong on this because it. So all the rest of it is just. Well, that's all the rest of it is like the translator making fun of him, or all the rest of it is he. I'll, again, I'll, I'll share more of it in our Patreon in between. But he has these like crazy things that he says all Egyptian women do. That's or all Egyptian like it, he he makes these huge generalizations that clearly can't be true um so i find this the most compelling part but how can he have read the odyssey or the iliad and still maintain that helen was in egypt when she's a character in the iliad because homer was wrong oh i see so that's his point herodotus is so but even in his account the of, conspiracy goes deep so homer didn't have his facts straight is what he's saying yeah and he and because homer is writing about 200 years before herodotus or the Iliad and Odyssey are coming together 200 years before Herodotus. And so he's trying, again, Herodotus is trying to figure out what actually happened. And his account of it doesn't involve the gods and this question of beauty. It's, there was, you know, this, this guy broke the hospitality code. A war happened because of that. Helen was restored to Menelaus. Like that's the on the ground or like non-mystical version of what happened. Um, I'll breeze through the... Re- so that, what what yeah. the embedded reporter said. And when, yeah, I guess he's in... But he's not... He's but, hearing all this secondhand. Yeah. Though, it's weird because he says the Egyptians tell him that Menelaus is the one who... Well, first it's Paris who told them the entire story, right? Because he's in the court of Proteus. Mm-hmm. And then Menelaus is the one who told them about the war. But again, it's 200 years after it happened. So, like, Menelaus didn't tell them anything because it was 200 years ago. But, I mean... I think Menelaus down. did visit... 
it yeah. was passed down and passed down and passed down. Yeah, yeah. But that's where you get into this question of what actually happened. Right, exactly. You can't answer that question. Sure. But but it's still compelling of, again, AJ, it's probably something you've thought more about because you teach this book. It's something I hadn't really thought about of, you know, I, I have thought, why is this war in the Iliad happening, right? Like, it, is it worth all this violence and bloodshed all over um, Paris marrying Helen? Well, it actually kind of makes sense if Helen's not actually there and they're just saving face to um, to their enemy. All right, uh, I'll move past that, but it is a super interesting part. If you're going to read book two, that's probably the part to read. It's, uh, I think it's book two, section 116 through 120, I think is what it is. But uh, go ahead and check that. Oh, apparently there was a poem at the time that was attributed to Homer. So there were, there are works that aren't, there were works that people thought were Homeric. Cypria is one of them that he, that he quotes here, but we now know that they're not Homeric. So that's where I think he's bringing in some other mm. stuff that at the time would have been called Homeric that now we know is not. Got so it. I think that's part of the confusion. Yeah, that'll wonk your sauce a little bit. Don't know what that phrase means. Um, I'll, I'll move on from it. Um, so uh, after this, um, I'll try and tell the story of the clever thief. If I don't, I'll do it in Patreon. It's a very good story. Um, so pyramids, speaking of conspiracies, Graham, yes, tinfoil hat wearer of mm-hmm. R three. How were the pyramids built? Aliens, obviously aliens is dumb. obviously the right answer. AJ, absolutely aliens, absolutely aliens. I mean, uh, them the is the lizard channel. people. It's on the History Channel. Well, it's uh, called the History Channel. Uh, unfortunately, it is true that the History Channel does say that. So here we are. Um, I'm going to pose a question. You can't tell me they didn't do it. Therefore, they did. I can. They didn't do it. <laughs> no, I just did it. So uh, if you were to take off your tinfoil hat, uh-huh. how were the pyramids actually built? Slaves. Yeah. So, <laughs> Slaves and simple machines. Yeah. Well, when you say simple and, machines, and maybe more? kites. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I've heard to because lift a lock. yeah, that when you if you use kites w- long enough with leverage, you can actually get kites to move pretty massive stones. Hmm. Um, and I, I, this may be crazy talk, but I thought that there was some evidence that there may have been like that kind of uh, work being used um, to to sort of help move the stones. But obviously, yeah, lots of manpower and. Yes. I mean, pulleys and fulcrums and levers and rolling on stuff. Yeah. and Yeah. Can I give you... So Herodotus says here how the pyramids were built. Oh, great. Oh, rock and roll. Okay. Let's do it. Easy. The pir- tell me if you find anything funny. Hippopotamus. He's just big. Yeah. <laughs> a giant... Put them on uh, water horses. Yes, exactly. Put tell me, ran, ran them up the river. <laughs> Name. Plus the babies, yeah. <laughs> tell me if you find anything cabin. weird with this description of how the pyramids are built. Uh, the pyramid was built like a flight of stairs, which some call battlements, others platforms. When they had completed the foundation level, so you've seen the pyramids, there are all these blocks. And so you have the right. foundation level and then another level, then another level, another level. Okay. So you build the foundation level. And when they completed, uh, they, when they had completed the foundation level, they lifted the rest of the stones by means of a device made of short pieces of wood, raising them from the ground up to the first tier of stairs. When a stone had been lifted to the first tier, it was mounted onto another lifting mechanism standing on that tier. And from there, it was hoisted to the second tier into yet another machine. Either they employed as many devices as there were tiers, or perhaps they used one single mechanism that was easy to move from one tier to the next after they had removed the stone. I get both explanations here exactly as they were presented to me. Is there anything weird? Nah, it seems oh, fine. Really? Oh. That doesn't seem weird. A little small wooden device. I mean, he could just be talking about pulleys. He could be talking about platforms. Little, little big, yeah, like little levers and yeah. just lift it up. I think it's hand wavy. So the only specific detail he gives is that it's made of short pieces of wood. And that's the only information he gives as to what this mechanism is. What more info do you want? But if you're, but if it's a pulley, you would mention the string. Like a, a pulley is made of more than just short pieces of wood, as an example. Yeah, could be a lever, mm-hmm. I guess. But that's not short because you need um, you get more um, leverage the longer it is. I guess it, it depends where you put your fulcrum. But it's short in comparison to the pyramid. But that's the like, that's my point of it being a hand wavy answer of like. If you're asked how were the pyramids built, and I told you short pieces of wood were used to hoist up giant blocks, I don't think that answers I'm the satisfied. question. All I'll say is this is called the Herodotus machine. This this thing he's describing is called the Herodotus machine, and it's oh. something of a like a notoriously like a goofy joke, goofy thing that he talks about of like how did they do it? Short pieces of wood. It's like well, like look at the pyramids. Like it was not short pieces of wood. They might have been used again. A pulley system might have been used. A lever might have been used. But there's more to it than just short pieces of wood. Or just, maybe they know how to use pieces of wood better than we do. Better than we do. That's Which is entirely a possibility. Yeah, me thinks you protest too much. Tape the wood to your shins. Yeah. You'd be amazed how much you can accomplish. Look, look, when you throw, yeah, when you have lots of people who are doing something, maybe it works. 
because uh, the, the answer ultimately is like labor, right? Lots yeah. of people. Um, uh, the then after this is a funny moment of I think someone pulled a joke on Herodotus and then it got written down. So they go to the pyramids and there are these inscriptions on the pyramids and Herodotus can't read them because he is Greek and he's from Halicarnassus. He's not from Egypt. So um, after the structure was complete, they finished off the top tiers first and worked downwards so that the lower tiers at ground level were finished last, just whatever this last step is. On the pyramid are written the quantities of radishes, onions, and garlic consumed by the workers. And to the best of my recollection, the interpreter said, as he read the inscriptions, that the total cost of these items was 1,600 talents of silver. Um, and then he goes on from there. You think, you think that someone's trolling Herodotus with that? Well, so a, an inscription... Hey, what's that say? Oh, that's the, that's the radishes and onions that yeah. the slaves eat. You didn't record the potatoes? No, no, no. <laughs> it's just the it was a very heavy crop radish crop. crop that year. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we can go to the pyramids and look for inscriptions. This inscription has never been found. And there's no sign of some, like, worn-down inscription about 1,600 talents of silver. The, the, great, <laughs> the great radish mystery. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, like, it's one of those things where you're like, would you expect at the end of the pyramids being built that they would write the number of radishes they ate? Do you know what, like that just seems like a weird thing for them to have done. It's an accomplishment. That it many radishes haven't been eaten before. Yes. Wait, what? I think it's or a silly a thing. Project. I can understand you pushing back and saying maybe this actually happened. This seems like one of those moments where Herodotus is not thinking very critically about this. He's just, he has said he's writing down what he's heard, but this seems like something you would ask more questions about before you put it in your book that's portraying like all of But haven't you seen history. those things where it's like, we did the yearbook this year. What did it cost us? Like 45 hours, 76 cups of coffee, blah, blah you know, and, yeah. and they sort of like do a little joke like that. They're yes. really, they're, it's they're hipster list. Yeah, yes, they're not exactly. doing like, yeah. it just took us like 87,000 radishes. Yeah. 380,000 texted memes. Yeah, 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 yeah. My point is that radishes and garlic are like a weird unit of measure again you would pick some like more uh substantive food if you're if that's the thing that you're tracking oh, it's garlic is just like a weird one to pick as your i guess radishes grow real fast measurement of time is that true yeah. no. i'm not a huge radish fan so I oh, know that. you're missing out with Am a little I? garlic mm. well apparently i'm apparently i am missing out because the pyramids were all about it um this is just uh so after herodotus says this about He's kind of hand wavy on how the pyramids are built. He has this weird thing where he believes the guy who tells him that the number of radishes consumed during the pyramid building is on the side of the pyramid, which is kind of silly. Um, uh, Herodotus will, he writes down something that a story that he's told by an Egyptian and he questions it. So he, he, he says that he doesn't know if it's true. And the translator adds to this. Here's another example of Herodotus's use of critical faculties. <laughs> Which just feels like another great burn of like, oh, he's actually using his critical faculties this time. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, I'm almost at time. I will read one story about a an Egyptian pharaoh um, and a, a story that he recounts. So this pharaoh, this king, this is known for not keeping regular hours in the... Um, uh, I was going to say temple. I don't know where he is, but... Court. He doesn't keep regular hours of court. He spends a bunch of his day hanging out. He does do business, but he kind of does it whenever he feels like it. And his close friends and family were disturbed by this behavior and admonished him. Sire, you are not conducting yourself properly by pursuing worthless pastimes. You ought to be seated solemnly upon your stately throne, transacting affairs of state throughout the day. That way the Egyptians would know that they're being governed by a competent man and your reputation would improve. But as it is, you are not acting at all like a king. And the king retorts, when archers need to use their bows, they string them tightly, but when they have finished using them, they relax them. For if a bow remained tightly strung all the time, it would snap and be of no use when someone needed it. The same principle applies to the daily routine of a human being. If someone wants to work seriously all the time and not let himself ease off for a share of play, he will go insane without even knowing it, or at least suffer a stroke. And it is because I recognize this maxim that I allot a share of my time to each aspect of life. So that, that's a good story. My, that's that's nice. what my students say. Well, yes. <laughs> when are, I tell are, them that they got to like work a little harder. Are they allotting their self care? Yeah. 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 Uh, like, and, and Herodotus does not condemn this guy. Don't he, string my bow. Yeah. Bro. <laughs> so make sure they don't listen to this episode. Um, so, you know, and Herodotus doesn't condemn this, this king and eventually Egyptians will prosper under, under this person's reign. So, you know, it's, I think it's a helpful story that, 
Self-care is ancient. It's a classical ideal, Graham. Don't you love that? Okay, so I won't... There are more stories to it. That's the thing you don't push back on is... What? The the bow. The lazy guy. Yeah, the lazy guy. who's Who's like... He happens to be lucky in that his kingdom is prosperous, even though he's not like behaving very well. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great story. There's a lot of other like little details in here. Um, I didn't read this from at the beginning. I'll, I'll wrap up with this. That um, you know, for you who is stuck to the end, uh, I if you are reading Herodotus, I would skip this section. I would not read book two at all. Um, I think a one hour overview of some of the highlights is kind of all you need. Um, especially since the main thrust of the story is going to be following this Persian empire in book three and book two has nothing to do with that, with, uh, the Persians. So, um, it's kind of a slog and it kind of takes a long time. So, um, again, these are kind of, these are some of the highlights here. I'll read, this is from like a guy who studies Herodotus. This is his view of book two. Book two is much the longest and most self-indulgent excursus in Herodotus's histories. And it gives the author the opportunity to discuss a wide range of aspects of ancient Egypt, but the longest and most self-indulgent of these excursi, excursuses. Um, but as he concludes this essay that he writes at the end of the book, Herodotus's account of Egypt is the oldest and longest classical discussion of the subject to have survived from any source but we must never forget that it is written to a Greek agenda and for a Greek audience. It therefore inev- inevitably reflects Greek experiences, interests, and preoccupations, and there is no attempt whatsoever to present an objective description of what was there or of the country's historical evolution. So, Man, there you really go. Here. Slaying on them. Yeah. yeah, so it sounds like it's just here's a whole bunch of wrong stuff about Egypt. Like, that's the yes, whole but the, chapter? Yeah, uh, the answer is yes, but also Herodotus's history is shaped how people viewed Egypt for a thousand years, maybe longer. You don't, you know what I mean? So yeah, like I wonder how many people were disappointed to not see the stick machine and the water horses. Yes. That's the thing. And like, that's what they thought. And you'll see portrayals of crocodiles, especially with those tusks, the way that Herodotus describes them. <laughs> that's not, that's not what they look like. Um, so it's, it's important. I mean, again, it's a book that's lasted for a long time, but also it's pretty importantly wrong on a lot of the things it talks about in this section. Googling crocodile with tusks. You want to go see that? Who opened this one? Did you? I, open did. This? I mean, oh. yeah. I don't know. It's, it seems like uh, the poor guy. Like it's not like he can go to the library and uh, Google sure. around. He's got. A, he's putting all this together. He's doing his sure. best. And I think you can take any of those stances of he was tricked in a few ways, or or there were translation different difficulties, and that he heard something that the person didn't actually say. Or is he trying to put up this like exotic? look to what Egypt is like so that Greeks will think more highly of him. That's kind of the question. In all I this. still think a hippopotamus is closer to a water horse than a water dog or a water bird. He is not wildly inaccurate in that way. Yeah. But or they a water don't burger well, here in Texas. Yep. Yeah, that's true. But oh, yes, well, I was, I was going to say, this is sort of a little off the topic. I didn't find any pictures of crocodiles with tusks, okay. but I did find what is maybe the coolest cigar cutter I've ever found. Oh, Thanks. Antique Austrian boar's tusk cigar cutter with uh-huh. silver crocodile head. Oh, I kind of like that. That is actually pretty so cool. I'm, Four grand. Yeah. No, oh, wow, that's less cool now. But ju- yep. Just to say, it's not that you'll find crocodiles, like actual crocodiles with those tusks. It's that that's like an artistic portrayal of right. crocodiles that you'll some, sometimes see. Oh, yeah. I was, I was trying to find oh, a painting oh, or something. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well. This has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. Um, hopefully in a thousand years when someone is looking back uh-huh. on these episodes that they can portray them with at least the same attention to detail and accuracy that Herodotus did with Egypt. And hopefully much um, more. I want to have tusks. Oh. Uh, Hannenberg wants to be, I don't know, like uh, the horse of the... Of the horse of the sea. The horse of the you sea. You want to be a, a, a hippopotamus? Hippopotamus. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, uh, uh, Meg B can be king of Egypt. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Wow, yeah, that's a promotion. Um, okay. so if you can find us at the guy, you can email us at the guys at classical stuff.net. That's also our website. Uh, you can tweet at us at classical stuff on the Twitters and I will like your things and retweet them. Um, you can find not only our in between episodes, but other Patreon goodies on patreon.com backslash classical stuff wherein uh, there are in-between episodes. We also have um, uh, weekly AM, or monthly AMAs, and you can submit questions. And there's some other uh, fun tidbits in there. And um, our patrons, uh, yeah, help keep this going and give us great topics to research and think about. And we are very thankful for you all. Um, and this is Graham Thomas and AJ signing off. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.